Today we're very fortunate to have Elizabeth May from the Federal Green Party and David Kuhn, leader of the Provincial Green Party, be our guests. We're in the middle of a provincial election in 2018, so it's hot time, it's go time, game time. And so we're lucky to have a half hour of their time. So thank you for being here. Thanks, thank Dennis. You. Yeah, thank you. National media is jumping all over Ms. May because of NAFTA work and yeah. protecting dairy industries and stuff. Can you speak a little bit to how that translates for New Brunswick or maybe between the two of you? Yeah, sure. I can say at the national level, and I'm, uh, I am I really think that Christian Freeland, our Minister for Global Affairs, has been doing a pretty good job. I, 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 I don't take cheap political shots. I know David doesn't either. Uh, managing the Trump administration is uh, unenviable and maybe impossible. But on this issue of our, our supply management for dairy, for poultry, I, we, we really need to stand firm. We need to protect our dairy and poultry industries. And the reason that I particularly feel uh, strongly about this is that our milk is high quality and does not include genetically modified organisms. Our milk is healthy. And the milk south of the border is produced using a genetically modified or organism called bovine growth hormone. And it's not just an opinion. The International Agency for Research on Cancer said years ago that this would, uh, was a uh, carcinogen, and it certainly creates ill health in the dairy, um, dairy industry. The, the cows are sicker. Now, we didn't register it in Canada. We said no. And that means that none of the milk in Canada has bovine growth hormone in it. But if we lose supply management and U.S. dairy industry folks are in competition and their product floods into our market, Canadian dairy industry folks are going to need, they're going to feel to stay competitive, they need bovine growth hormone. Hmm. We'll lose what we have now. So for the health and financial viability of dairy and poultry and for the health of the product that we get in our stores, we must hang on to keeping U.S. milk out of our market and we must hang on to supply management. The other thing it does, if I can add, uh, Dennis, is uh, with with a supply management system, it ensures there's sufficient return to the farm family that they can operate their dairy herd at a scale that is sustainable, that is not on an industrial scale. So people are familiar with the size of our dairy farms in New Brunswick. They're you know they're they're a, a reasonable size. They're not industrial sized dairy farms, and so that's better for the animals. Mm -hmm. uh, way better from an animal welfare perspective, which is important to us as Greens. Uh, it's way better for uh, the farm family because they can they have a uh, they have an, an operation that's a family scale, and they have a return that enables them to make a, a reasonable living as farmers. You compare that to uh, other commodities in the agriculture in agriculture that are not don't have supply management systems or marketing boards associated with them, and it's a whole different ball game. Um, so this has proven to be a good solution to sustain um, those those families, those farm families who are in uh, the, the supply management system and who um, who are able to manage herds on a sustainable basis, on a, of a sustainable scale, and avoid having to go to this industrial scale that scale that they are operating with in the United States, yep. which leads to the kind of thing that uh, Elizabeth was talking about in addition to big concerns around animal welfare. Yeah. And isn't it interesting how um, it took that to get food or one food product onto the discussion during a provincial election? Uh, the narrative is always driven by economy, money, tends to be big business, which in New Brunswick is, is narrow focus compared to small business and, mm -hmm. and farming. I and mean, when you've been on the show in the past, I'll always bring up, what can we do about farming? How do we integrate that more into the narrative? And how do we integrate that right into the root of our economy? But, there, but there's, I mean, the, the narrative in the media and the narrative of the old line parties is 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 rooted in this this old approach in terms of the way they their worldview basically uh, that no longer holds water in, in today's world and looking into the future. So uh, that's why our platform, for example, has a significant concentration on transitioning agriculture and uh, building the local food economy yeah. in New Brunswick. Yeah. And that's critical. We have, this is part of the disconnect and it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, the disconnect between the interest of uh, New Brunswick families, New Brunswickers in uh, local food and becoming more self-reliant as a community, as communities and as a province for food, 
um, to be able to feed ourselves more. Uh, and what the old line parties talk about, you know, I'm the one, I brought the local food bill into the legislative assembly, uh, and it was it, it's for a good reason that it was that it was me because it comes from uh, the approach the worldview greens bring to our work and the fact that we actually listen to people on the ground and what they're looking for, and that's what I was trying to deliver. Yep. And of course, you ran into the wall that is the legislature with the old two-party system. Absolutely, but <laughs> but after uh, this election is going to be a pivotal election. It's going to be uh, the results. I think are going to be very different, and mm -hmm. and we're going to see, uh, in our case, a good number of green MLAs elected across this province. So, Ms. May, you've witnessed in other places where people have finally made the switch. Yeah. And you've watched it impact on provincial legislature. Um, yes. Do you have any thoughts watching where it happened before to yeah. potential for it to happen here? Well, it, we're on the cusp here in New Brunswick. It's clear this is an historic election where Greens are set to make a lot of gains. What happened in British Columbia, and it's a very similar story. I mean, first was me winning a seat when everyone said Greens can't win a seat. And then after that, Andrew Weaver, leader of the British Columbia Greens, went, ran, and the next one to win was David Kuhn. So it's been building. But in British Columbia in uh, May of last year, we ended up having what's, uh, what, what is, I think, healthiest for democracy, which is a minority legislature, mm -hmm. so that no one party had all the power. That's the problem, by the way, with our voting system of first past the post, is the minority of the votes mm -hmm. results in the majority of the seats most times. But when a minority of the votes gives you a minority of the seats, that's closer to what that's what the public voted for. And nobody in, with a minority of the votes should have 100% of the power. So when you have power sharing and discussion and, and working collaboratively and developing agreements to work together, that's what's happened in British Columbia. It's changed things remarkably. We have a government now that is forced to listen and forced to keep its promises wherever those promises were part of the agreement with the British Columbia Greens that said not that there's a coalition, the BC Greens didn't get any power out of it, they just said as long as you keep these promises, things like a pilot program in basic income to fight poverty, improving money to our education system, honoring the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, bringing in a referendum on voter reform. There are very specific items in many of them, and anyone who's interested can find them online. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful set of promises. The, the British Columbia Greens negotiated that and would have done it with the Liberals if they'd been of a mind to keep those kinds of promises, or with the NDP. The NDP said, we'll keep all these promises, and in exchange, you won't bring us down on a budget vote. That's all. And we're getting much better government, more reasonable government, more cooperation uh, in British Columbia as a result of that change. Hmm. One of the narratives that runs through New Brunswick quite often, and it'll tie to what Ms. May just said, is um, the people truly in power in the province aren't people that are elected. Is one of the ways of unlocking that um, what Ms. May just mapped out in BC? And do you see a potential for that? in New Brunswick, if there's a minority government and Greens or a combination of Greens and other colors or the influence or the balance of power, does that take away authority or power from the backroom players that tend to dominate our narrative? It would diminish it, but it wouldn't take it away. Okay. Because, you know, the old line parties have proven time and time again when they're in government, they're quite willing to be captured by, you know, a big corporate interests or to be captured by uh, narrow partisan interests uh, focused on just getting reelected and delivering a, a partisan agenda. Mm. Um, we need to get away from that and that means uh, having leadership like the kind of leadership I can provide that will not permit that to happen, to, to, to have the courage to stand up to powerful interests and say, no, sorry, like Louis Robichaud did, yes. sorry, we're not doing this. We're acting in the public interest. Our job is to, to advance the, the common good, listen to the people of this province, um, look for the long term what's in the best interest of our children and their children, mm -hmm. and act. Yeah. And that's how we would operate. That's how Greens operate. And I think I've demonstrated that as the as sole Green MLA in this last legislative assembly. That's how I operated. So there's a record there for people to look at. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of it. And uh, that's how Green MLAs across the boards in Canada now operate and more green MLAs in New Brunswick will function that way. The narrative that comes through most elections about debts and deficits, um, is that a deflection from the root issue 
Um, governments have always run debts and deficits. Are, are mm -hmm. there other things we should be focusing on and not that? And that will take care of itself if we focus on these other things? Well, in a Iran's a context that won't take care of itself. I mean, it's not the only thing we should focus on, but it is an important thing to focus on. Um, I've been on the Public Accounts Committee, served there for four years, receiving the reports of the Auditor General, asking her a lot of questions, reading carefully what she's written. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly what she's saying is the rate of growth of our debt is unsustainable, unsupportable in the long term, and unless we put in place a plan to stop that uh, rate of growth and then start to bring it back down, mm -hmm. we could be in very serious trouble as interest rates rise, as they're likely to in the future. and so. To me, that's just that's sensible. She's been ca actually called on the Liberal government and the Conservative government before them to put in place just such a plan, and none of them have done it. Yeah. And and we're saying we would do it. We would put a plan in place to do exactly that. We will have f uh, responsible and sustainable budgets um, that uh, uh, will contribute to that. But to sort out how to do this well yes. and fairly and justly, uh, we would we would launch an inquiry right off the bat. Say, so look at the fiscal situation and, and seek advice and input on the best way to tackle it and then act on it. That's a clear thing. And we're not the kind of party saying, well, we're going to cut here and cut there when we've got unjust tax policies, mm -hmm. you know, where, we're, where we've got public subsidies for um, uh, property tax for a heavy industry in this province, essentially, where they're paying very little, where we've got uh, public subsidies for um, industrial electricity rates and uh, on and on. So part of that inquiry would be to look at also the tax system to ensure that it is fair and just and that uh, everyone is par paying a fair share, which isn't the case now. More and more of the burden has fallen to individual families and, uh, and large uh, corporations have been uh, bearing less and less of the burden. Do you see on a national scale um, how New Brunswick uh, often positions itself as like the incubator, mm -hmm. the small province where you can get things done quite quickly because yeah. we're smaller, more nimble, more adaptable, theoretically. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, do you see a potential in, in New Brunswick having the work that David just mapped out yes. that would be nice to do and then watching that hum in New Brunswick and then being able to pull that across the country as here's how you shift how government is done. Absolutely, and in particular, I'm, we've talked about the benefits of, uh, of the program that looks at local food and, and helping to ensure that farmers can make a living farming and that people living locally can get access to healthy food. Mm -hmm. But let's take that again and say, what's the biggest challenge? It's on, well, I can tell you in my community in British Columbia, it's on everyone's mind, is the, is the sense that our health care system mm -hmm. is declining that things are, and people are falling through the cracks. Well, if we, if you can do it in New Brunswick, I mean, if, if, if David Kuhn and the New Brunswick Greens form government and you're able to implement the collaborative, holistic approach to health care on the provincial basis here in New Brunswick, I guarantee it will be picked up by every province because it saves money, improves health care treatment, mm -hmm. provides compassionate, timely care to people who need it. And we have a lot in common across this country. I mean, New Brunswick has a particularly uh, senior population. My own federal riding in British Columbia has one of the highest levels of seniors in our population. We're facing similar problems. Where's our mm -hmm. dementia strategy? Mm -hmm. Where's our senior strategy? Mm -hmm. Where's the plan to ensure that people can stay in their own homes, live in their own homes, and be properly cared for? What David st sketched out in the release of the health care platform for New Brunswick Greens, I mean, if you talk about the right size economy, the right size province to prove something that works, yeah. go for it. Do it in New Brunswick. I guarantee everybody else will follow because it makes so much sense to say that doctors aren't solo uh, uh, entrepreneurs, that they work in collaboration with pharmacists and with uh, midwives and with physiotherapists and with nurse practitioners. The collaborative approach to healthcare that's patient-centered and patient-focused but based on a team that knows that patient, works with them. That's the model for the future. And while the rest of Canada is struggling with rising health care costs and not sure what to do about it, hmm. I think New Brunswick has a solution, and the solution is elect more Greens and see that change happen. Hmm. Thank you for that. Tied to that, because we, we were talking on the edges of systemic change, because we talked about a food system and a health care system, and, and where's the tipping point in that system to have something shift? And then, and because when that shift occurs, it'll be quick. Mm -hmm. It'll take three or four years as opposed to 30 or 40 years like an education uh, system takes a cohort. 
in there is do you have any thoughts of where the tipping points would be and, and also the issue of waste um, we often talk about growing an economy got to grow two or three percent a year to kind of mm -hmm. stay ahead of the curve but if we spent the same amount of time talking about a 20% or a 30% waste model because that 2% growth is often based on a waste factor of some sort yeah. um, can you wander into that? It might be a bit of an odd question. No, it's it, not. It's, it's brilliant, actually, Dennis. I'm sorry for jumping in, but when, when we were talking about agriculture, one of my most recent conversations before Parliament rose for the summer with Lawrence McCauley, who's Federal Minister of Agriculture, was hmm. what are we going to do about the fact hmm. that 30% of the food in Canada is wasted? Hmm. That's a crime when hmm. people are going hungry. Hmm. So 30% of the food is wasted. Then you look about the debates we have about energy. How much energy is wasted? Because we're wasting money, which we can ill afford to waste, mm. heating the outdoors in the winter mm. and cooling the outdoors in the summer because we don't have the programs to ensure that our homes are energy efficient mm. and that we're not wasting our money heating the outdoors in the winter. We keep it inside and are able to stay toasty warm for much less money, mm. much less cost, just because we're fighting the waste issue. Mm. So if we if we put in place the policies and programs that move us towards a zero waste society, a zero carbon society in New Brunswick, as an example, we're small, we can do this fairly quickly and, uh, and can be an example for the rest of the country, and then uh, we would have achieved much and, been, and, become, and we would become quite a model for people in, uh, in Canada. And that's why our, our platform contains exactly those kinds of measures, and those kinds of objectives uh, to move us in that direction. Um, it's it's something now that has really captured the imagination in a way of young people um, around waste, right? The whole issue of waste, and they're thinking particularly about plastics now. And and the the the, the, the plastic problem is has galvanized young people uh, to organize around um, this idea of moving towards zero waste. I had students in grade 10 from FHS approach me after learning about the plastic island in the Pacific Ocean, wanting to uh, hold a forum to help build awareness among their, their, uh, the students in their school, but also in younger students, among younger students. Mm -hmm. And they did so. It was an amazing thing they organized. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is really starting to touch people in a way that I think maybe the older generation doesn't understand. And they're ready and wanting to see real I good ideas and action that is going to actually tackle these problems, to tackle climate change, to tackle waste in society. Um, and that's why we have such strong support among youth uh, in New Brunswick and uh, across Canada for, for Greens. Yep. Now they just have to make that leap to vote. Yeah. You know, and I don't mean that in a bad way because it, it's a long running discussion. When you go three or four questions deep on an issue, it's always interesting to see what pops up once you get past the surface and see yeah. underneath. So it turns out, uh, the best my research has shown, that our school system, especially high school system, yeah. really doesn't integrate civics, social studies mm -hmm. um, into the agenda. Right. So when I ask students, they're like, oh, last time I got anything about how to vote was in grade nine and it was a six week unit and they didn't need it by the time they were 18, like they couldn't pull it up and it didn't have a relevance yeah. to their daily life. Plastics would have a relevance to their daily life. So the question then would become, can they connect that story you just shared about plastics in Fredericton High School with the act and participation in voting yeah. like are they almost there do we almost have a bridge i don't know I, I think you know my bill to lower the voting age to 16 mm -hmm. and and elizabeth you've introduced something similar it's exactly in, in, the in same Parliament federally would would i think that's what would do it because it would be paired with civics education mm -hmm. so that that students don't have to say well i'm going to be able to vote at 16 and we need to support them yeah. with good civics education that's going to lead to all kinds of discussion among their friends with their family uh, before the vote comes when they're first able to vote and uh, to me that is where the connection comes in if you're able to vote at that in that period of your life where you're just open to the world open to the world and not weighed down by being at university and and living in this kind of turbulent <laughs> turbulent world that university life represents but you're yeah. still living mostly uh, likely at home yeah. uh, with your parents or parent and uh, it's a much more stable environment at which to begin the process of thinking about yeah. uh, the democratic process and your and your place in it and how to how to engage 
but it's got to be complemented with a strong focus on civics in in, in the school system. Yeah. I think it would be beautiful. I think um, the uh, Andrew Weaver also introduced something like yes, yeah, same this, bill. Right. And the, David Kuhn led the way in New Brunswick with that proposal for legislation. But we now have private members bills from Greens in British Columbia, in the federal parliament, in New Brunswick, calling for this. But I, I just wanted to add one piece to this. When I was on the uh, Special Parliamentary Committee on Electoral Reform during the period when Justin Trudeau had promised we were going to change our voting system, <laughs> not to revisit how sad that is, but one of the things, we, we held hearings in every province and territory in multiple communities as a, as a parliamentary committee. And of course, we were looking at the federal voting system. So quite a lot of this is provincial jurisdiction. But there wasn't a community we went to where we didn't hear from a retired school teacher somewhere, I'm really concerned because we aren't giving our young people civics education. Mm -hmm. The curriculum is too weak. They're not getting enough information. And so there's a couple ways to go at it. If we lower the voting age to 16, then they're absolutely in a context where they're paying attention because they're going to get a chance soon. But if that legislation were not to go through, we still could be revisiting at a provincial jurisdiction, absolutely. provincial level. Where is the curriculum that tells young people, you're in charge of your own future. You're a voter in a democracy and you're a citizen. We get a ton of information that tells young mm. people they have no power. Mm. The overall context of a consumeristic society is you're here to try to get a ticket, get a job, spend money. You're a consumer in an economy. And we need to educate our young people. You're a citizen in a democracy. You're in control of your own future, but only if you are an active citizen, which is actually more than voting. Mm. It's getting busy and having campaigns that clean up shorelines. So you're talking about plastics. I mean, it's something that Girl Guides always do is get that shoreline cleanup going in the spring yep. along our coastlines. There's a lot where young people could engage and know their vote means something. Hmm. And that curriculum piece has been missing, not just in New Brunswick. I hate to say it, it's cross-Canada problem yeah. that the education young people get doesn't tell them that their vote makes a difference. I had three social work students in my legislative office this year or last year who uh, with a with an intern another student intern put together a series of three videos called Legicate Yourself mm -hmm. which were designed to um, communicate what they were just learning about how the how our democratic system works and uh, to, and, and they they were excited and enthused about the idea of sharing that with other young people to present um, what basically they had learned. So this is how it works, mm. and it's 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 yeah. great. It's funny. It's clear. It's it's concise, um, and it's been in high demand by teachers. We went to great lengths to try and make sure it was nonpartisan, yeah. and uh, we sent it out through the schools around the province without any particular permission from anybody, <laughs> and uh, and many teachers. Uh, told us that they really thought it was helpful and, and they used it with their students. And it's still up? It's still up, yeah. Legicate yourself. I love that. I've got to look it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll put links uh, yeah. with the show. That'd be great. Um, so uh, five minutes left, roughly. Um, what's the main topic that, that's hot for this election? And from what you see from the outside in and, and you sitting in the hot seat in the middle of it all. Can I throw in, I'll just say I think it's about democracy. New Brunswick has an opportunity to lead the way, and I think one of the messages I'd like to share with people, because m let's face it, most voters in New Brunswick historically either vote Liberal or they vote Tory, and they kind of know it's going to switch back and forth. This is the election where you can actually decide that you want to make sure that those old line parties that have disappointed you don't, don't get too much power. They're likely to get in, hmm. but don't let them get too much power. Hmm. And when you elect Green MLAs, you've got a much better opportunity that what you get is Greens who work across party lines helping to deliver good government, hmm. but keeping those other parties to their promises and making sure they're accountable because that's the missing piece in democracy. Once they get through an election and say, woohoo, we have a majority, they forget all about the voters till election time again. Hmm. And Greens can make them accountable. Hmm. One of the things I'm, I'm finding at the door here and in other ridings when I'm campaigning with local candidates um, running for the Greens, it is clear that people see the system overall as quite messed up. And they don't know where to start to even think about it, you know. There's, they, they see problems in health care, and that's probably the first uh, number one issue for people in terms of accessing health care, um, particularly uh, accessing mental health care. 
uh, for young people. Uh, we have a system that essentially is rudimentary and cannot anywhere near touch the demand, and it's growing significantly by leaps and bounds, and I'm very concerned with that. Uh, conventional medical care, uh, you know, the waiting times for ER, uh, the waiting times, to the, the, the long years of waiting for a, a primary care provider, a physician or a nurse practitioner, uh, the poor rural ambulance service, and on and on. Uh, the, pro the, 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 the burnout of the staff in nursing homes and the difficulty in getting home care, that's just in sort of the health related side of things. You look around at other areas and you find similar problems. So people are at the door saying, it's messed up. And I'm saying, yeah, we need system change. We actually need to restructure the way we do things in a way that's more collaborative, that's more decentralized to get away from this sort of one-size-fits-all approach developed in an office in Fredericton that's then spread out across the province and tried to be applied in every instance um, to more locally driven decision making. Mm -hmm. Uh, and th that, and, and then restructuring to focus on actually doing what government's supposed to be doing, that is protecting and empowering. Protecting people, protecting communities, protecting the environment. Empowering people, empowering students, empowering communities. Um, that's what we should be focused on. But you need to then be focused on what's happening on the ground um, and put your, f your emphasis there. And those are the people you need to be collaborating mm -hmm. with um, here, here's an interesting example, and it's, it's, it involves seniors. So one of the best, uh, wonderful example of seniors housing, um, so the seniors don't have to live in isolation, uh, and this isn't, support, this isn't a nursing home, uh, is in Fredericton, run by the Kinsman Club. And the housing is on a, a single story, and the units are all inward facing, with a garden in the middle, on Wagner's Lane. It's beautiful. And everyone in there loves it, and it's exact. And they 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 can meet. They you know they can can meet each other. They can socialize when they want to and be in their own place when they don't. Mm. And uh, it it feels so good being in that in that little court, and that's the kind of model that should be uh, followed and spread around the province. Uh, but it requires a government, who's you know, in their very DNA says our approach is to collaborate with you. So if you're the Kinsman Club or a local cooperative uh, or a community organization, we as government will col collaborate with you to help establish these kinds of alternative housing arrangements for seniors. Okay. And you know what's great in a housing arrangement like yeah. that? I have a, uh, a project like that's getting off the ground where I live. Seniors housing, shared housing, daycare center in the seniors housing. Yep. Because yep. nothing is as great yeah. for little kids as getting to hang out with the grandparents' generation. Yep. And nothing is as much fun when you're a senior as having, when you want to, well. a little bit of babysitting <laughs> time. So they're, they're working it out yeah. with mixed ages, but still seniors living together yeah. in quality housing is a, a real solution for a lot of the challenges across the country. But mm -hmm. the key is government can't deliver it itself. It's, it's got to be something that's going to be developed um, yeah. by local groups, yeah. local co-ops, local community organizations with the support of government to implement. Yeah. And following your themes, and thank you for that, is um, it doesn't have to be more expensive. Oh, no. A lot of times it's actually less expensive. Absolutely. And secondly, and, and a final point to let you play with in this space, um, we've gone through several different topics in very quick order. Um, they all have a common theme, which is a shift towards trust away from here's this problem, that problem, this solution. That's, we can go through a whole program of strategies that way. But the emotional underpinning that goes with making a vote, because yeah. voting is emotional, is the issue of trust. Can I trust you not to lie to me? Can I trust you to actually go do this? Um, can you speak into that space? Because that will not appear in mainstream media and narrative. They won't talk about the emotional side of this exercise. And to some of us voting, it, the whole exercise of election is hugely emotional. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is something I'm quite passionate about. You know, there should be no daylight between us and our government. Mm. But we've got to a point where we think of the government over there that does things to us. Right. Yes. And we've got to, we've got to move to the point where we, where government is collaborating with communities, supportive of people and families and uh, working in that uh, in that way so that uh, so that we get get to the point where 
um, our government, it is our government, and our and yeah. we trust our government. And our government is not doing things to us, but doing things with us, yes. right. shoulder to shoulder, to really uh, make a real change in people's lives in their community. And you can see this in David. It's one of the core elements of our values as Greens, is that when you're elected, you haven't won the lotto. You've been hired to do a job. Right. And your employer, the people in your community, in your electoral district, th those are your employers. You work for them. That's why there's no daylight between good government and the citizens of that democracy. So what I think about the emotion of voting is that when people realize they can elect a green MLA, they start feeling happy. <laughs> and for the first time in their life, they can go in and vote and walk out of the polling station with a smile on their face thinking, I just did a good thing. I feel good about it. And if you elect a green MLA, you can feel really happy. And uh, for the first time, I mean, it's really cool what happens. I've heard people say this about having you as their MLA. For the first time in their lives, they're really proud of their elected MLA. They feel good about it all through the year. I, that's, that's my MLA. I elected him. So, you know, we need more of that. Absolutely. Wonderful way to finish. Thank you so much for all of this. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Dennis. Really great to be with you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for watching. As always, if you like the show, support the show, share the show, make comments on the show. Be good, have fun, love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAcheson.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.